Okay, we're going to notice in all these verses, uh, Tim just read the first one, where it says uh, three transgressions and for four. Okay, that just simply is a, frame, a phrase uh, meaning repetition and abundance. Okay, um, it doesn't mean they committed three and then a fourth one and that was it, four transgressions. It just means that the repetition and the abundance, and it's explaining here God's total exhaustion of patience with them. In other words, I've had it with you. I can't endure it any longer. Um, that's the idea of the, the three transgressions and for four. So what, what do we see here? Um, what's, uh, what's he charging? Damascus with. Remember, it's the capital of Syria. What does he, what's he charge them with? Playing with the Gadi. The witch guard? Playing with the leaves. Yeah, yeah. The fighting, you said? Yeah, yeah. The, the extreme cruelty in warfare. The idea of, uh, um, because they have thrashed Gilead with implements of, of iron. You know, we think of thrashing. Mine says threshed. Isn't threshed? Right? Oh, yes, okay, well, threshed. And then we cut down Right. wheat, yeah. so they were cutting right. down the other nation. Right, Timmy, that's right. I was thinking threshing. But, yeah, it's that's what you do. You thresh the wheat. Um, the idea of, uh, I was thinking of when we were kids and we got a good thrashing from our fathers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with implements of iron, um, they just, their cruelty and warfare, in other words, was unbelievable. And God had said, that's it. Um, you've, you know, you've um, attacked my people, you've went overboard, uh, in other words. And so he was going to, to make them pay for that. And then down in verse uh, 6, 
chapter 1 and verse 6. Do you have that, Annie? Yeah. Okay. Thus says the Lord, for sweet transgressions of Okay, thank you. Um, now remember, Gaza was one of the uh, five principal cities of the Philistines. And what is God um, charging them with here? What do you, what jumps out at you first of, of that verse? What were they doing to Israel? Captivity. Yeah, right, right thing. They were taking uh, Israel captives of war, but they were going beyond that. Um, they weren't just taking them as, as captives in war and then, you know, keeping them in a, war camp, if you will, whatever, they were selling them. They were selling them to the Edomites, um, you know, which uh, was kind of arch enemy of Israel. But they were capturing and then sending them off, selling them to the Edomites, which the cruelty there would have been, might have been worse, really, than being in a war camp. So God was charging them, I'm going to judge you for that, for what you have done. And then uh, verse 9, down verse 9. Okay, um, Phoenicia was uh, Tyre, okay, was, uh, was a, another place for the, for the area, another name for the area. But if you had remembered <clears throat> about Tyre, see where we read there, of course, they sold, they delivered up Israel to Edom also. But it spoke up there and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. I couldn't figure out what that was, so I went back and read and looked. And if you remember, uh, King Hiram had long ago um, made a covenant with King David, okay? And then with, with uh, King Solomon. He made it with David and Solomon and even... Uh, even Jonathan, he made a covenant with them, recognizing their God, the God of Israel, and their freedom to worship. So they made that covenant with Israel. Um, you know, they didn't follow God, they didn't follow Jehovah, but they recognized that Israel did, and they gave them uh, the freedom to worship. But then, they took opportunity to sell Israeli slaves to the Greeks. So, you know, they not only, uh, well, that was even worse, wasn't it? They made a covenant, and then they broke it. So God said, well, that's it. You know, um, if any of them were kind of maybe doing the worst, here we see Tyre. Um, doing that, um, reneging on their <laughs> covenant that they made with uh, with Israel, um, with David and Solomon. And then verse 11, verse 11, I'll, uh, Henry, can you read verse 11? Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions are hidden and fulfilled. And we are not throw away his punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off our pity. His anger tore uh, perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. 
Okay. Here's another verse you kind of got to put a little study into. Uh, Edom, the nation of Edom, uh, they were a brother, if you will, to the Edomites. Okay? And they traced their lineage back to, uh, to Esau. But from the very beginning, they had a stormy relationship with Israel. Okay? And uh, they would at times uh, help others in their attacks on, on Israel and Judah. Um, and, you know, we see in verse 11 where it says, because he pursued his brother with the sword. You know, pretty sad when we um, act in that way. Bad enough we act that way, but when we do it with a brother, um, you know, and, it's, and uh, Amos says, you cast off all pity. You didn't even come to your senses and uh, realize the shame uh, that you were bringing upon yourself. And their anger <laughs> just grew and grew. Um, it never relented. And so for those reasons, um, God says, uh, Kala? Uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, Edom, I mean, Esau, uh, they were the brother of the Jacob and so on. But remember, Jacob is the one that drew first blood, so to speak, I mean, by deceit. He took his birthright from his father. But I mean, that doesn't mean that you could get away with anything in here, in this circumstance over here. But when one starts something and the other one calls it and pursue, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's not going to solve any situation. Right. Right. Somebody has to be the silent one and try to compromise for peace sake. But in this case, God is inflicting punishment on Esau, the, the, the Edomites. Right. He didn't mention about how Jacob is the one. I mentioned it. Because, I mean, it started with him being, you know, in the beginning, how he sold his birthright to, eat, to, to Jacob, right? Exactly. So I'm just saying that things could still link up. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just, that's, uh, my that's right. Jacob was the deceiver. It makes me think of the refereeing in the hockey games. And Tammy and I never agree on that. And I always say, well, it wasn't fair what he'd done to that guy. No wonder he came back and had a fight with him. And Tammy goes, well, he's the retaliator. He should have left it. Well, the same with that. And the same example. He, Jacob deceived him, but I mean, uh, Esau willingly sold it, and so he has to live with his uh, actions, his choice, right? And uh, that didn't give him a right, did it, to attack them forever and ever and hate them. You yeah, know, it shows the power, doesn't it, of hatred. It just grows and grows. Um, and down to verse 13, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, uh, Lisa, do you want to read that, please? Okay. Um, this is a pretty pathetic scene here, isn't it? Um, Amen. They, these were descendants of, of Lot, so secular history says, and it put them in the lineage uh, of Israel. And uh, even so, with that, with that line, we, we see here and understand from this verse that I just worded it, they were killing the, the pregnant women. Um, the Bible even uh, sets it out in a grosser manner of, of ripping them open. In other words, they were, they were killing the pregnant women of Israel so as to keep the population from growing in Gilead. 
and for those for that horrible action uh, God said that um, well in verse 12 reading on he would send fire upon them and uh, devour the palace in other words destroy it level it um, through his uh, his vengeance and that's why he was laying it upon them you know they stooped to that in chapter 2 and verse 1 uh, we'll read about Moab. Call on the teacher. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because he burned the, the bones of the king of Edom to lie. Okay. Okay, now this judgment's being carried out against who? This one Moab. is... Moab, right. And Moab was another country descended from Lot. And, and what does it say that God is punishing them for? What was his reasons? He burned, he burned the bones of the king of Edom, which is Esau's descendant. Right. Or right to ashes, right? Right, Kyle. Yeah, yeah. Everything I <clears throat> could find studying on that was uh, they burned the bones of the king of Edom um, to lime. In other words, burned it right up. Um, which uh, in ancient times, and never mind ancient times, God's charging them with this. Uh, they weren't to do that, uh, you know. But in ancient times, that was a disgrace uh, to the person's memory to burn them, to, to burn the body, the bones. Uh, that that was held as a disgrace um, in in ancient times. Um, but also, we see here God wasn't pleased with it. Uh, you know, so Moab, um, well, he goes on to say he's going to send fire upon them and uh, devour their uh, palaces. Uh, Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting and trumpet sound. Um, so that just displays God's anger um, with that nation. So we see then that all those nations that God allowed to... Uh, bring trouble to Israel, and now it's it's their turn to be judged. God was going to judge them. He used them, but, you know, it, it was their opportunity now to, to take what they, uh, get what they deserve, if you will. So we move on to the doctrinal section of Amos. And remember, Amos is intended to teach um, that God expects to see justice on the part of his people, okay? In relation to their dealings with one another. We, we move now from um, the nations, now we're dealing with one another and, and righteousness in relation to their dealings with him. Not only how they're to deal with one another, but how they're to deal with him. And, uh, rather than them carrying out violence and, and corrupt worship. And it also taught us, as Dave brings out in our next question, how did God, how had God tried to bring Israel to repentance? If you turn to chapter four, verses six to 11, there's, there's five calamities that are recorded here that God had already sent upon Israel and um, made the claim to them too that they had brought these things on themselves. Um, if we read there, verse 6 to 11, um, in that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant 
and the outcasts a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. Where are you? From Sorry. now on. Oh, well, the, the where are you? Oh, chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. Is that what you have? Oh, oh, I'm in Micah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I was wondering. I, was wondering. <laughs> I apologize. That's okay. I was, uh, by the time I got to that verse, I thought, hmm, this doesn't sound correct. Okay, we're in the right book now. Amos. Um, verse 6. Also, I gave you cleanliness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when there was still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city and withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part with it. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees. The locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword, along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a fire band plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Um, wow. I didn't catch on, did they? <clears throat> what, what are some of the uh, things that God did to Israel here um, to have them see, to change their hearts, to help them change your hearts. What, uh, <clears throat> what analogies here do you see? First in verse 6. Right, the cleanliness of teeth, Gore, is that what you're after? And yeah. Lack of bread. Right, yeah, that's right. Um, that indicated lack of food, famine. Um, God brought famine on the land, and yet, what happens? They didn't, no, they didn't catch on, did they? Oh, um, and uh, what do we see? Kind of similar. What do we see uh, next there in verse 7? Drought. The, the witch on drought? Yes. Yeah, lack of rain. Um, Selective drought. The, the witch goes? Selective drought. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Drought before the harvest, it says there, doesn't it? And so when, one city and not on others. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so that meant a, a total loss of. Food, didn't it? A game for them. The idea of, of famine. And then, uh, and they didn't catch on. Did they? And then what do we see uh, next in verse uh, 9? An infestation of locusts, mildew, it, blight. Right. Uh, fig trees, olive trees, and yet you haven't returned to me. Right, that's right, Cal. Yeah, crop disease and locusts, they wiped everything out through uh, mildew, blight, um, you know, and the locusts destroying everything. Um, the fig trees, I read about that. Fig trees, uh, Israel relied even now, they use the, the figs for everything, they, you know. Um, the lack of all those things taken from them, along with their food, still they don't clue in. God, as God says, you have not returned to me. And then, uh, what do we see in verse 10? What do we see in verse 10? Pestilence. Which word? Pestilence. Yeah. 
okay, yeah, plagues, uh, and the young men being killed with the sword uh, is speaking of warfare, um, reminding them uh, of Egypt. We see along with your captive horses, um, the stench in their towns is all the, the idea of suffering, uh, the stench of dead, of the dead, uh, disease following war, you know, and yet <clears throat> they don't clue in. And we see in, in verse 11 that God uses Sodom and Gomorrah. That was the scale that God used um, by which all disasters uh, were measured and the thought just being total destruction. Um, and the fire brand pluck uh, is the idea of a stick being snatched uh, from the fire, you know, with one end ablaze, um, indicating God's last minute rescues uh, for them um, from their fate. Um, and yet, he says, you haven't returned to me, um, you know. And so because Israel had not returned or repented after all these cal calamities, um, now they're going to meet their God himself, Amos says. And their fate, he says, is going to be even um, more terrible than they can imagine. Uh, you know, as I thought, sometimes there's lessons that we can take from this for ourselves is the fact, too, um, you know, judgment is coming for all mankind. Um, and if we think we have problems here upon earth, and if we think things aren't all um, peaches and cream, as the old saying is, just wait. Judgment's coming. And there will only be two places that we will spend eternity. So, you know, we look at what God has done with Israel. Um, remember that all are going to be judged. And so we move on then to our purpose, our section under Jesus Christ. And uh, we're asked, what is the connection <clears throat> between the following items of Amos' prophecy of the future? of God's people and Jesus Christ. If you, if you turn over to uh, chapter 9, make sure, we, make sure I stay in Amos, chapter 9 and verse 11. Um, Gord, maybe if you look that up and I'll get you to read that. Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. In that day I will rise up the, the booth of David that has fallen and repair its branches and raise up its ruins and rebuild as it as in the days of old. Okay. That's it. What version have you got? Where it said boom. Uh, American Standard. Oh, okay. English, sorry, English Standard. Right, right. Yeah, well, I was going to make that point. The tabernacle here uh, in the King, the New King James, and probably a few, um, means booth. That was the original word, booth or a hut. And, and that is used to contrast to the house or palace which King David built for, for himself. And it's used as a comparison now in the state of Israel at this time. Okay? We're, we're thinking of David's um, glory and his palaces and, uh, and, and God is, is saying, um, now you are Buddha <coughs> compared. So why do you think he uses um, this comparison? And, and what's this connection um, between, uh, between uh, Israel and, and Jesus? What? It's going to be rebuilt. <coughs> risen up. Right. Right, that's the whole idea. 
Okay? Um, Israel at this time, um, God's having her see that you're heading for total ruin, like a fallen hut, like a, 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 a shambly old booth compared to what David had. Um, but God's wanting them to see that he'll fulfill his promise to David. Remember back in 2 Samuel 7, 11 and 12, um, he made the promise to David. Um, and so the fallen kingdom could only be raised up again by, um, as we know, an offshoot from King David's family, um, which would be none other than the Messiah, right? God with us. Again, and the idea is, um, and we see this a lot in the Old Testament, again, he will tabernacle with man, with us, through Christ. Remember, he was always with Israel in the tabernacle, and uh, sometimes we forget that comparison. Um, he is now with us, God with us. He's now tabernacling, <laughs> if that's a word, with us through Christ. That's our privilege. And then uh, verse 12, um, Tim, do you want to read that, please? That they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Okay. And what... Uh, you see a connection there? Well, Jesus died for all people. Right. Including the Gentiles. Right, there, that's one, yeah, the Gentiles. And now we're called by um, God's name um, because of, of Christ. And Edom is mentioned here because uh, while being related to the Judeans, um, they were of all nations actually the most hostile uh, towards Israel. Yet some of them were to be welcomed back into the kingdom of God, it, which is in harmony with what James says. If I uh, quickly jump over to Acts 15, Acts 15 and verses 16 and 17 reads, uh, and with this, the words of the prophets agreed, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I'll rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I'll rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Um, so that's speaking of us being received into the to the kingdom of God. As remember, yet before Pentecost, we had no hope, did we? Um, only God's people, uh, the Israelites, the Jewish uh, people, the faithful Jewish people. And then verses uh, 13 to 15, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Tim, and we'll read a verse each. And we'll read those three um, verses. Uh, yes, uh, chapter 9, you read verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the Romans shall overtake the people, and the children of grapes in who sow seed. The mountains shall drink with sweet wine, all the hills shall grow with thee. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruins of the inhabitants. They shall turn the rivers and the streams thereof, and they shall make gardens and the fruit thereof. I will plant them in their land. The land which shall they be put up, for the land that I will give them, says the Lord to her. Oh, how you will be cut out. Would they not have stolen Joseph at the I pray because 
had to come to you. Yes, they, they did not have enough some minutes. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, what did him? Oh, did you read that? 15? Uh, 15. Oh, okay. That's all, right. That's all right. Well, we'll end with this anyways that Bell is gone. But um, just quickly then, the thought here, we've just read about all the punishments that God's bringing upon uh, the nations in Israel. And, and here we see a reversal, don't we? A total reversal. Now God's giving Israel the promise of blessings. Um, that he would bring upon his people. And the idea of the plowman overtaking the, reap, uh, the reaper, remember in that part of the world, um, plowing fall work took place in October in the rainy season, and the harvest took place usually in early June. And through God's blessing, there was going to be such an abundant harvest that the reapers are still going to be working in the fields trying to pick the harvest and the guys are coming to plow. <laughs> That's how bountiful it would be. And the same with the grape harvest, uh, which usually was in midsummer um, or to the fall. Uh, the grape, the grape treader, the one that would tread the grapes, um, he would overtake, he would overtake the reaper. And the same with uh, the grain. Um, in other words, the harvest would be so abundant that it, it would last into the fall seasons, as, as we term it, because we live in this side of the world. Um, you know, when you're ready to plow your land, they're still going to be taking off crops because there is so much of it. Um, and it would seem the idea of the mountains and, and the land flowing, they're just flowing with, with produce, that's the idea. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to...